I wish it was warmer. I'm really rather cold. I'm used to warmer environments like, well, there are no warmer environments than, than this. So it is good to see you all. Uh, I am grateful for the invitation uh, to be here at Wild Goose. This is my first trip uh, to Wild Goose, and um, I'm having a blast. I also never get to, to teach or preach wearing shorts and a t-shirt, and I'm going to make that mandatory wherever I go uh, from now on. So um, I know that some of you have just camped out in chairs here. You just decided to be here all day, and you were just going to listen to whoever was uh, on this stage. But if you, at, if you uh, are interested in what I have to say, uh, here's where I'll start. Um, the, the biography or, or autobiography of theologians and of ethicists is rarely of very much interest to people. What did you do? Well, you went to school, you read a lot of books, and, and then you maybe wrote some books and went to school some more, and then you died. You know, so nice life. Um, but people routinely now, since I wrote my book, Changing Our Mind, in 2014, uh, people ask me, how did a guy whose high school yearbook said, my life ambition is to be a Southern Baptist pastor. I mean, that is there forever, together with that feathery hair, you know, from that period. It was so lovely then. How, here comes the music. No, okay, that was just me imagining it. Um, how did a Southern Baptist pastor end up writing a book calling for full LGBTQ inclusion in the church uh, kind of early in that conversation in the evangelical world? Um, my critics ask me, what went wrong with you? When did you become a heretic exactly and, and slide down the slope to hell? And my friends say, basically, uh, we really want to know because we would like to see that transition happen with more people. <laughs> um, so what I've been asked to do today is, is to talk about my story a little bit. And so I'm going to give you seven moments in my my religious pilgrimage and moral pilgrimage and and hopefully it'll be of some interest so I was raised um, in the Roman Catholic Church I was born in uh, Germany but raised in Northern Virginia and so I was a cradle Catholic I was baptized Catholic um, my father was not a believer my mother had the burden of carrying four of us to Mass every Sunday, and uh, I was the oldest of four. The Catholic Church at that period was in the Vatican II period, and um, uh, the effect in that congregation in Vienna, Virginia, uh, was they didn't really know what to teach anymore after Vatican II. And so I was, um, I was exposed to a version of Catholicism that I would say was confused. My mother, who was Irish Catholic, uh, robust Irish Catholic stock, she, she laughed at it. She said, every year the message is, God loves you, draw a tree. And that was it. That, God loves you, draw a tree. And trees are good, and God does love you, but the, there's a little bit more to Christianity. And so I remember uh, I became increasingly rebellious, and... And I, then I, I was taken through the confirmation process. Were any of you confirmed in the Roman Catholic Church somewhere in your journey? We have a handful of people. And that time, the bishop got involved. It got real serious. We were uh, given a lot of doctrine. And it, and it became uh, clear to me. I, I said to my mother, um, this, they're pretty serious about this doctrine stuff, but if this is real, I need to see its effects. I need to see that, that Christianity matters in the lives of people. And it didn't seem to at that time. And so I told my mother I was never going back after I was confirmed. And that was the end of my Catholic journey until uh, an interesting coda more recently. But one thing I would say about that experience and something that I try to say to a lot of young people now, the lesson of that experience for me is that one presentation of faith 
of the Christian faith, for example, is not the whole of it. Um, a lot of people have been exposed to some version of Christianity which does not give life or does not seem real or does not, um, does not work for them, and they think that's the whole of the, of the faith. So one presentation does not equal the faith. So, so I left uh, when I was 14. I wandered in the wilderness. I was interested in Ouija boards and ESP and all kinds of stuff. Um, but then my salvation began when I dated a renegade Southern Baptist girl in high school. She, um, she was a renegade because she didn't believe any of it, but she still had to go. And that was how I got exposed to the Southern Baptists. Um, by the time I was 16 years old, I really needed a relationship with God. I didn't know it, but they knew it when on a Friday afternoon, uninvited, I walked into a Southern Baptist church. I just walked in. Nowadays, the security guards would throw you out or something, but at that time, I walked in, and there was a nice janitor named Carter who said, uh, yeah, you're welcome. The youth minister is around the corner. Uh, and I met the youth minister. His name was Carter. And so it was Bobby Carter and Kenny Carter, and the president was Jimmy Carter, and he was a Southern Baptist. And so I had reason to believe that all Southern Baptists were named Carter at, at that time. Um, but what I remember about that church was that, was that they welcomed me, and they overlooked all of my immaturity. They also had a sense of mission that when somebody comes looking for Jesus, you should tell them about Jesus. And so um, I went on a Friday. By Monday, I was a new convert. And I, I became a born-again Southern Baptist as a 16-year-old. You know, Southern Baptists used to be known for evangelism. Uh, now they're known for what? Women can't be pastors or associate pastors or anything, but they used to be known for evangelism. Um, what I learned from the Southern Baptists at that time was that being a Christian meant something real in one's life. That it meant that every aspect of life was supposed to be about seriously following Jesus. That The way you got trained up for that was by reading the Bible, by going to church like all the time. <laughs> all the time um, by uh, by reading good serious books uh, by, and that it was a life of purpose and I needed that at that time but here's what so that formed me to become who I became it, it took me a little while to realize that 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 vision of personal piety Bible study evangelism discipleship, all of that was good, but, but there was no social ethic in that church. There was no, um, here's what being Christian means in public. And there was also no grappling with the heritage of Southern Baptists on race. It was completely not discussed. And, and so that's something that, that had to be brought to me elsewhere. But still, love acceptance, forgiveness, and community, a sense of purpose, a sense of identity, all of that happened through that church. And I would say that I think that, that people still do need love, acceptance, inclusion, and community, and that if churches can offer that, they will still be relevant even here in the year 2023. I also discovered a, a sense of vocation they said, okay, the first decision you have to make is, are you going to be a follower of Jesus? And they said, that means you accept him to save your, lot, your soul, basically, and then you commit to follow him in every aspect of your life. And I said yes to that. And that sense of identity never went away. But then they said, some will be called to ministry, and within six months I felt called to ministry. And so by the time I was 17 years old, I was sure I was going to be a, a Southern Baptist pastor thus the unfortunate uh, entry in the um, yearbook. So this legacy of identity and formation, of vocation and purpose, of discipleship and seriousness of direction is something I would commend. 
And this is something I also want to say to those of us who are on the other side of evangelicalism or on the other side of Christianity even, um, we don't need to throw it all out. There are things worth preserving. And we need to ask what those things are and try to preserve them in maybe some healthier forms. Okay, so I'm going to be a Southern Baptist pastor. I went to William Mary, major in religion. Uh, went to the Baptist Student Union, became president. Went to Southern Baptist Seminary when I could have gone anywhere, but everybody knew that if you were going to be a Southern Baptist minister, you went to one of those schools. But then after that, after getting ordained and, and uh, getting uh, all of that, um, I went to Union Seminary in New York. Oh. Because that's exactly what Southern Baptist pastors do. They, they, <laughs> they go to Union Seminary in New York. The main per person behind this decision was a man named Glenn Stassen, Christian ethicist of fine distinction. And he, had, he uh, loved that school um, and, and wanted me to, to broaden my horizons. So I went to Union Seminary. I was 22 years, no, 25 years old, uh, married with a baby on the way, um, uh, very insulated in the Southern Baptist world. And the first class I had was with a man named James Cohn. And so, Southern Baptist boy meets James Cone in the fall of 1987. And James Cone was, was on fire. He was a great teacher, and he scared me. He said things to me I had never heard before. Um, and, and it went on like that. My, eth well, my, my first ethics class was with Beverly Harrison, a radical feminist, liberationist. Let's just say we didn't do radical feminist liberationism at Southern Baptist <laughs> Seminary. <laughs> None of those things. Um, so I would say that, the, that this engagement was a pivotal moment for me because, because I had to decide whether I was going to be open to learning something new. And I will tell you, in all honesty, it took a while for some of what I was hearing from Beverly Harrison and James Cone and LGBTQ colleagues and professors for me to be able to process it. So maybe there's a lesson there too. Maybe some of us who have moved in more progressive directions are so clear about what we now believe, we don't remember that it was a journey. And sometimes people need to be led along on that journey. We need to, we need to help lead them on that journey if they're open to the conversation. Um, one other thing that was really pivotal about that period for me was I wrote a dissertation on the Holocaust. Uh, specifically, I wrote about that small percentage of Christians who rescued Jews during the Holocaust. Did you know that the best way to think about the Holocaust is it was a state-sponsored annihilation genocide campaign led by the government of a historically Christian country carried out in historically Christian countries all over Europe with millions of Christian people all around from among whom the Jewish people were plucked to be killed. And so the Holocaust actually involved day-by-day -day decisions on the part of Christians as to what they were going to do in relation to their neighbors. And I decided, well, the, reading about the Holocaust nearly destroyed my faith. But I went to a conference and I heard a presentation on that minority of people who are called the righteous Gentiles of the Holocaust. They risked their lives and sometimes paid with their lives to save Jews. And I remember uh, going to a conference where a Holocaust survivor was speaking and she was asked, was it Christianity that motivated your rescuers? She was Polish. And she said, well, um, yes, but not just any kind of Christianity. She was Jewish. She said, not just any kind of Christianity, because there were all kinds of other versions of Christianity that were motivating people to kill us. She said it was only a certain kind of Christianity that did it. And that phrase never left me. And I, if you don't hear anything else I say today, I hope you'll hear that a certain kind of Christianity, a, a courageous kind of Christianity, a compassionate kind of Christianity, um, 
an unconventional kind of Christianity in areas filled with anti-Semitism, um, a risk-taking Christianity, a justice-oriented Christianity. I used to think, I and mean, what I was taught was, you want to make everybody Christian. That's the goal, conversion. Now I'd like to help Christians learn to have their own certain kind of Christianity and so that they could be a, a force for good in the world, a certain kind of Christianity. Also, during that period in, in my journey, I took a job with a man named Ron Sider. Do any of you know the name Ron Sider? Recently deceased, I, I want to honor him today. He became famous in the 70s for writing a book called Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. He helped to pioneer justice-oriented evangelical Christianity. He was an Anabaptist from Canada. He ran a little organization called Evangelicals for Social Action in Philadelphia. And so we moved there. And for three years, I learned a, a version of evangelicalism that has essentially disappeared. And so I want to honor him and honor that version. Egalitarian, environmentalist, uh, concern for the poor, justice-oriented, anti-racist, peacemaking, evangelicalism. Can you imagine such a thing existed? Yes, yes. Have any of you ever known people like that? Yes. Yes. Now they're mainly called ex-evangelicals or ex-Christians. And so with Southern Baptist in my background, Union Seminary is still rocking my world, Ron Sider helping me to understand that there was a, a social justice kind of evangelicalism that I could pursue. The only job I could get coming out of PhD work was at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in 1993 when a young man named Albert Moeller had just been named president. He and I started at the same time. So for three years, I lived through the fundamentalist takeover of Southern Baptist Seminary. And a pivotal moment in that journey was when the president decreed something that, that we have just seen in the headlines. He decreed that no faculty member who believed that a woman could legitimately be a pastor would ever again be advanced at Southern Baptist Seminary. This decision was made like overnight. I remember the faculty meeting where it was announced. I remember the female colleague who ran running from the room and threw up in the hall because she felt so assaulted by that decision. I remember the colleagues who were younger like me who had to decide if they were going to try to finesse that issue or lie or whether they were going to let their jobs go. Um, I remember a person who can only be described as a henchman of the president come to me in a dark, rainy afternoon, I'll never forget it, in my office with the door closed, and he said, Gushy, you got a bright future here. We seem to only have this one problem. We ask you to tell the trustees that you don't support women as pastors just one time. You don't have to believe it. Just say it one time. Um, it's like that scene in uh, It's a Wonderful Life where Mr. Potter reaches, the, reaches out to George Bailey and offers him that job, if you've ever seen that movie, and, he, and, and, and his hand's all slimy, right? It was a slimy moment. But you know, there are people still in Southern Baptist life and in places like that who made that deal and who have had to deal with the conscientious cost of that ever since. I watched people finesse that issue. They threw their sisters in ministry under the bus so that they could keep their jobs. Any, ever seen anything like that? Yep. I was able to escape, a lot of, a lot of people weren't, but I was able to get a job in West Tennessee at another Baptist school that wasn't quite as rigid and so for 11 years, I was able to, to be uh, a kind of a progressive evangelical thought leader. It's not hard. There weren't many thought leaders. And, <laughs> you know, it's like, here's your pool. You know, there's three people, and you're one of three. You know, so great. Okay. You know, wrote a textbook that people read. And I got to speak at all these Christian colleges and seminaries and stuff. 
Um, but in 2005, 2006, the winds began to change. Um, I was asked to address the issue of torture. Remember when our government was torturing people explicitly? Christianity Today magazine asked me to do an analysis of torture as a moral problem. And so in 2006, in February, that came out under the title, Five Reasons Why Torture is Always Wrong. It's one of the best moments of my career. But it wasn't seen as one of the best moments of my career by most of the people that I worked with, by most Southern Baptists and Evangelicals, by people who were ardently pro-Bush and Cheney. I remember the critiques. Uh, this was my favorite one. Um, you're being divisive. <laughs> That's my favorite. We need Christian unity. We don't all agree on this. Therefore, you can't talk about this. That was nice. I said, no thanks. Um, you know, also, evangelicals were beginning to take uh, climate change seriously in 2006. There, was, there were leaders, pretty highly placed leaders, who were doing climate change work, and I ended up having the chance to draft a document 17 years ago called the Evangelical Climate Initiative Statement, in which we said, hey, it looks like climate change is real. Hey, it looks like it's going to be serious. It's going to affect the poor and those with the least resources the most. We all have a responsibility to address it. 17 years ago, what if the evangelical Christians of the world had said yes to that call and had changed their course 17 years ago? Um, the main response I remember from that one was concern that George Soros had funded the ad that was placed in the New York Times. By 2007, it was clear that that evangelical Christianity was more, at least on the public side, was more about marriage to conservative politics than it was about following Jesus. And so in 2007, Mercer University rescued me, a formerly Southern Baptist University. The president said, I don't think you're going to last there very long. Why don't you come here? And you'll have the freedom to do your own work. And so that's what I did. I took a job in Mercer in Atlanta and Macon in 2007. You know how nice it was to breathe free air? Yes. yes. I want to say to any minister or any academic or, or any, any uh, parachurch or anybody, any, anybody, if you have to sacrifice your conscience to do your job, get another job. Yes. You know? But that's so hard. How many times have I heard from people... I can't. I've got kids. I've got responsibilities. I can't. But anyway, so after 2007, I was at Mercer breathing some free air. And one of the things that was new to me was I was meeting a lot of LGBTQ people um, at, at Mercer um, and at my church, my, uh, my lovely little Baptist church. And over, the, over these years, I began to, to think, you know, the exclusion of queer people is is really problematic, it's really hurtful. Somebody needs to take this issue on in a full serious treatment from within the evangelical world. And then by 2014, it became clear to me that I needed to do it. And so I wrote a book called Changing Our Mind in which I, I tried to make a, a from the ground up argument as to why we needed to change our mind. And by the end, as many others who have made this journey will attest, by the end, it became a really heartfelt conviction that the church, the church has been wrong about this issue for 2,000 years. The church has wounded millions of people, driven people away from God, compromised its witness, all in the name of a misreading of the Bible. So, so in 2014, Changing Our Mind came out, and the response of the evangelical world was worse than I could have anticipated. Um, we're done with you, you're a heretic, you're misleading people, you're going to hell, everybody who listens to you is going to hell. And I can tell you that wounded me a lot, but it also propelled me out of a community that I, I didn't really belong in anyway. It also opened doors to friendships and ministerial relationships with LGBTQ people all over the world. I discovered, uh, by the way, there's a movie you need to see while you're here called The Grove, about this church in North Carolina, the, the pastor and family are here, that a church that decided to become inclusive. 
I discovered that there's so much freedom and joy and renewal and so much of a Jesus experience being in the community of the marginalized when your privilege is taken from you and you're with those who have been, who have been pushed to the side. That's where Jesus was to be found. The most profound experiences of spiritual worship that I've had in the last 10 years have been with queer, queer Christians who are welcome and are overjoyed. And that's happened all over the world. So since then, the end of the story is I have a book out that deconstructs evangelicalism. It's in the tent. You should buy it. It's called, it's called After Evangelicalism, and it's pretty intense. And here's, here's a copy. Um, it has a picture of a maze, and the image is many evangelicals got stuck in the maze somewhere. They, they couldn't get past homophobia or sexism or anti-science or right-wing politics, and they thought that there was no way out, but there is a way out. Spaces like this are a way out, and they represent a way out. So I'm now finding myself with post-evangelicals. I'm in the post-evangelical crowd. These are people who still claim a heritage there. They understand it, but they're exiles or refugees or they've chosen to leave and they want to do church life on the other side of that. That's where I'm to be found and that's, that's what I'm trying to do as a pastor. And I'm also taking on um, the grave problem of evangelicalism's involvement in anti-democratic authoritarianism here and around the world. Um, the, I think what's happened is when the evangelical Christians uh, joined the with the Republican Party beginning with Ronald Reagan they hoped that if they could just elect Republican presidents and make those Republican presidents do what their agenda was on the political side that they could take America back for God but America wasn't too interested in being taken back for their version of God and so as the culture has continued to move away from that vision and political strategies have, have had uneven results, um, some evangelicals are joining other radicalized Christians and non-Christians in a movement that says, well, if the democratic process doesn't work, let's just not bother with the democratic process. That's part of what, that's why it wasn't just that Donald Trump wanted to stay president for life. It was that many millions of people believed that it was God's will that he should stay president for life. And so the election results were not authoritative. And so January 6th included many people who were filled with religious fervor that God was in the uprising. There were Confederate flags and, and American flags and Trump flags and Christian flags on January 6th. So I have a little book that will, I, I'm sure will endear me to many of my formerly Christian friends. Coming out in October, this is the only existing copy. It says, Defending Democracy from Its Christian Enemies is the name of the book. Um, and it's a study of anti-democratic movements in seven historically Christian countries, not just ours. This is a global problem. So are there any lessons to be learned from this sad and happy and hopeful story? Um, I'll, I'll leave you with a couple and Ken Minimo will come up with some beautiful song that is going to wrap this up, I'm sure. There's going to be time for questions, I think, too. Um, I believe that people need convictions worth living and dying for. I think that life without convictions that we build ourselves on is barren. It's um, flat. And I first discovered convictions around Jesus when I was 16 years old, but then I guess the, the second thing I've learned is that where you start with convictions doesn't necessarily have to be where you end. If we are alive, we should be growing. We should be learning new things. We should be thinking and reading and praying and talking and emoting and engaging the world. So we need convictions, but if our convictions are, are unchanging, then we're a fossil. Secondly, I, I think about discernment. 
I'm old enough now to look back on a pretty long journey and to, and to think about decision points in my journey. Do you ever think about those major decision points in your journey, those moments? You could go this way or that way. There was this fork in the road. And your life has been set, the course of your life has been set by your decision points. Maybe there's some more ahead of you. Maybe there's some more ahead of me. I look back and I tremble at some of those decision points. Like I went to Union and I was different because of it. Union helped to plant the seeds for changing our mind. Union helped to plant the seeds for um, fighting against torture and the anti-racist work that I've done. If I hadn't gone to Union, I would not have become who I became, but I, it was a near thing. I almost didn't go. And after the first week, I almost left. <laughs> so there's, there's mystery about those decision points but also gratitude for me. Also, I would say calling matters. My first sense of calling was to follow Jesus. My second sense was to be a pastor. I, I learned that the Southern Baptist part was negotiable. And the third was to be a Christian ethicist. And those callings have never gone away. And so, like, where, where is your sense of calling? And what, how does it sit right now? And how, it ha how has it evolved? And fourth... I, I want to reemphasize the idea that religion can be good or bad. It depends what version it is. Don't think that the world will be better if we can just banish all religion. It's about what kind of religion is in circulation. And that is something that is being negotiated day by day in churches and families and homes and schools and so on. And lastly, I want to say that I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the way I think God has not abandoned me in my journey. I'm grateful for the people who have forgiven me the errors and mistakes of my journey. I'm grateful for near misses, getting out of Southern Seminary, getting out of Union University. I'm grateful for mercy, for growth, and for community. And I'm grateful that I think that the Jesus who said, okay, I'll take a flyer on this gushy kid, the 16-year-old raw kid who wandered into a church, that I don't think Jesus has given up on me either. And so I would like to express my gratitude. Thank you all very much. Now we've had to change our minds Go another way Let's not lose all we got in those old days Hang on to have thine own way, Lord. Hang on to the old rugged cross. Hang on to just as I am. And don't let it all be lost. Hang on to the passion and the purpose. To follow Jesus and hear your call. In these times of changing, Get rid of it all. Oh, they walk a narrow pathway that you and I cannot walk. And they talk a hateful language that you and I can't talk. in the country and it breaks your heart and mine don't give up all that made them shine oh hold on to have thine own way hold on to the old rugged cross hold on to just as I am don't let it all be lost in these times of changing minds this time of a different day please don't throw it all away now we'll pray for sisters and brothers and friends and family too Pray that they find the light of compassion Do what they need to do 
get on our knees and pray all those we still love pray that in its good time God's message will be enough ooh don't lose half thine own way hold on to the old rugged cross hold on to just as I am don't let it all be lost in these times of change when we find another way don't let go of all the good stuff from yesterday Ooh, don't let go of the good stuff from yesterday